Tree Lane. Yeah, that'd be up Tree Lane. Terrible dangerous place. Well, Jack Blackie was so furious because we saw that Slippery Sarah had been telling on him. He went and turned himself to a girt toad and under a doorstop, the girt big stone, you know, that goes across the ditch like. He sat himself there so that when she stepped on her threshold, he'd ever. She'd be his. As a soul sleep. Well, Slippery Sarah, I wouldn't call Slippery Sarah for nothing, and she'd got her ideas as to what was happening. So she'd come back on her tippy toes, widdishens, round, long ways round. And before she gets down into the road, she has a little look, see. And under the stone, I'll be a girt black toad sitting waiting. And then Slippery Sarah, she rub her head together and she cackle and she jump on Victor's stone with both of her feet. And stone went down, crack, smash. And Slippery Sarah, she danced into her cottage. Jack Black went never seen no more. <laughs> that was Ruth Tongue telling us about the goings-on in Hob Tree Lane. Many of Ruth Tongue's stories were written down by Dr. Catherine Briggs, who spent a lifetime studying folk tales. What really happens with folk traditional narrative or poetry is that people repeat it from one to another with involuntary omissions and additions called out by their audience, because this is spoken to a listening audience whose comments and whose reactions to the thing are automatically ad adopted into the tale. And therefore what you get in a, a folk uh, art of any kind is what the average man is most interested in. The retelling gradually smooths out the things that only interest individuals and uh, emphasizes the things that interest more people. And that gives you a starker style, but one that can be enormously emotionally attractive. So although a particular individual may be a storyteller and a recognised authority in his community, the final say is with the audience. The story told is shaped by popular demand and approval, and of course by the common beliefs of the performer and his neighbours. And there are no beliefs that capture the popular imagination more strongly than those of the supernatural. Folk tales are full of encounters with ghosts, witches and fairies. One of my own particular favourites is this story of a fairy straying told by Seamus Ennis. This tune was acquired from the fairies, as the story tells it. It's about a man who was at a spree one night and with all the dancing and all the drinking and the late hour coming home he decided to take a shortcut home through the fields and uh, he was travelling and he thought it was a long time he was getting home and then he began to find himself arriving back at the same place every time and he knew then that it was a chaperon she had come on a, a fairy strain and the old people tell you but if that ever happens to you, what you do is take off your jacket, turn it inside out, and put it on inside out, and you'll find out immediately where you are and find your way home. This man turned his jacket inside out and directly found himself within three fields of home at the top of a long field. And he walked down the field and he heard the music. And then it was a kind of a bright night. He saw the uh, fairies dancing and heard the piper playing. And dawn was coming, summer time. He sat down on a hillock and he could see them plainer and listening to the music of the piper. And they were dancing this hornpipe when he fell asleep. And when he woke up, the sun was high in the sky and the fairies were all gone. And he went in home, two fields more. And there were early risers, they were up. And what kept you out till this hour of the night? And he told them the whole story, coming in with your jacket turned inside out like that, just to make it look good. They wouldn't believe him at all, that he was sleeping it off in some ditch or other, and, or maybe that he was out courting a lassie. 
But he said, no, he said, I'm telling the truth and I can prove it to you. Because the hornpipe that the piper was playing when I fell asleep, I memorized it and I can play it for you. And he did. And they believed him. Because that was a hornpipe that was never played or heard by anybody in the old people in all the surrounding district. The older kinds of traditional narrative material uh, are obviously very much in decline. Later you'll find some new tales, the big old fictional tale types uh, today. You may get them among some uh, immigrant groups uh, and among special ethnic groups like, like gypsies, for instance. Uh, but you won't get them from your average settled Gloucestershire farmer or London uh, business executive. But on the other hand, there are tales which are being generated which are set in the modern world, the modern urban legends, as I call them, and these quite often arise out of the sheer incidents and the type of civilization that we live in in cities. Stories which involve motor cars or flying or uh, radio broadcasts and things of this kind, and people do generate new material out of that kind of stuff. I suppose one of the best known, uh, probably, is what I call the, the severed finger story. Well, this actually happened to a mate of mine. He was coming back home late one night through the Blackwall Tunnel. He'd been doing a bit of night work over on the Essex side. He gets through the tunnel onto Greenwich Light, and there's these three geezers standing by the side of the road, so I'm in a lift in there. Well, my mate, it's a bit late, like, so he pulls over, give him a lift, he says, I'm going down Deptford Way, you know, can I give you a lift? But as he winds the window down, he says the first couple of words, and one of these geezers comes running towards the car with a great big chain wrapped round his fist, doesn't he? Like a sort of bicycle chain thing, see? So my mate puts his toe down and he pulls the car and he drives off like, and as he drives off there's this whacking great bang on the back of the car and the geezers hit the back of the motor with the chain, doesn't he? He gets home like down there, he parks the car outside his house, and he walks, locks the doors up, walks round the back to make sure there's no damage, and there on the back bumper there's this chain wrapped round it. But the thing was, in the chain, there were three of this geezer's fingers, weren't there? I'm sure a lot of you will have heard a version of that severed finger story. It's always told as true. I certainly believed it happened to a friend of a friend of mine, until one day I heard from another friend that it happened to a friend of a friend of his. An interesting point about that story is that, although it seems to be completely modern, there is a version dating from the 18th century. In this, a highwayman left his fingers in the window of a coach that he attempted to hold up. Stuart Sanderson believes that these modern urban legends behave in the same way as older kinds of legend material. They're told for true. They're in fact fictional. They're given all the circumstantial evidence of names, places and dates, and they even set the action to a certain street corner. But I wonder just how long stories such as that will remain an important part of community life. Nowadays, people seem to rely such a lot on radio and television for their entertainment, and I wonder if this will eventually kill off the old art of storytelling. I was glad to find that William Russell doesn't seem to think so. Old tales are still told, I think, uh, if anything, more effectively by media such as television and radio. Um, they can, in this way, be disseminated and diffused much more quickly than they were in the past. This is not only true of, uh, uh, of tales, but also perhaps of songs and things like that. But all the same, you, you uh, mustn't underestimate the, the enormous extent to which folk tales and other aspects of folklore are still being transmitted in ways that have got nothing to do with radio, television, or even writing. The famous example of this is the, when the film Davy Crockett came out, uh, and it may be regarded as a stimulus to folk songs, children in playgrounds immediately invented their own version. Born on the rooftop in fantasy, joined the Ted when he was only three, cost a cop when he was only four, and now he's in Dartmoor forevermore. Davy, Davy Crockett, king of the Teddy Boys.
Well, this uh, song like this, I can't remember if it was actually this version, was transmitted from Sydney in Australia to Cardiff in three weeks. This will give you an idea of what is going on quite happily, irrespective of all the uh, print, uh, radio, television and so on that's going on in our world. And that was done by the children with, with no technological aids other than perhaps telephones. <laughs> And the Davy Crockett film shows very clearly that here a film which was of the most sort of uh, Victorian uh, uh, sweetness and light and, and the actual original song about Davy Crockett was full of, of uh, dewy-eyed idealism about the fellow gets instantly changed by the children into whatever they particularly want at any given moment and then transmitted as a folk song. I see no harm or ever in uh, the mass media, and, and it seems to me that it's the duty of folklorists now to study them as part of the whole transmission process of modern folklore. Here's a recent example of the influence of television heroes, or in this case, anti-hero. It's from Samantha Rogers, a schoolgirl from Rotherfield in Sussex. I'm only a poor little Ewing. JR keeps on picking on me. When Sue Ellen gets drunk, her baby turns punk, and Bobby jumps into the sea. Pamela's got no babies, Miss Ellie and Jock have got three. Lucy went mad and told of her dad, and Bobby is still in the sea. Cliff Barnes is always a loser. He gets blamed for killing, you see. When he fell down and sighed, poor Pamela cried, and Bobby is still in the sea. Poor Bobby. The actor who plays Bobby used to play the part of another folk hero. Do you remember him with his green contact lenses in the television series The Man from Atlantis? But where on earth do songs like that come from? My cousin from Hastings School told me she learnt it from school. She told me the first verse, and I think it's the first line of the second verse, and I worked up all the rest by myself. I think that very often folklorists of the more old-fashioned type forget that oral tradition survives, not survives, no, is regenerated and, and, and newly generated uh, within urban cultures and urban civilizations. Uh, every single one of us, it doesn't matter whether you're a doctor or a dentist or a bus driver or a traffic policeman, we all participate in the exchange of oral traditional material every day. We tell stories, we tell jokes, uh, we repeat legends and fictions which have been recounted to us very often for two uh, by other people that we meet at work or in the office or on the bus on the way home. Uh, so we're all, we all participate in this the whole time. It's a very essential part of our culture. Stuart Sanderson. So it would seem that despite the advent of the silicon chip, the video recorder and data processing, folk tales and the oral tradition are alive and well and living just as happily in London, Birmingham and Glasgow as they do in the more remote areas of the west of Ireland and the highlands of Scotland. And they're quite capable of adapting and changing to suit the evolving society. Tales of fairies and giants can easily be changed into tales of UFOs and strange telepathic experiences. By the way, if you have a folk tale of your own, I'd love to hear it. So why don't you send it to me and maybe I'll be able to use it in one of the future programmes.